So, welcome to our uh, project demo. Maestro improviser, music generator with an attitude. So, what we hope to show you today uh, is first of all music in computers, is MIDI, is how to it, it's done, music theory, uh, our model, uh, challenges, and then a couple of demos and another approach. So, uh, our goal, which we found to be rather a complicated and ambitious one, was to predict a note in the end of a series of notes. So, those series of notes would ideally be some melodic line. So, you can think of such melodic uh, line as a, a melodic sentence, such as uh, the a very familiar song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, How I Wonder What You Missing Notes. So, uh, that was the challenge. And uh, first of all, before anything, we need to talk about how music is represented in computers. So, there are two main different ways to do it. Uh, one is uh, one that you probably uh, seen and you use it uh, every day and all the time, which is digital audio. So that would be wave and MP3s, streaming, etc. And uh, that is the same, actually the same format representation, you can see it on the left, uh, that uh, started in the era of CDs. And when you open a file in any software, you can see this kind of wavy thing. And this is in contrast uh, and opposed to an analog signal that was produced by uh, vinyl records or, or tapes. It is actually a digital representation of a sound wave, which is continuous, sampled to be discrete. So in an MP3 file, for example, um, those samples are uh, so fast that we cannot even notice that it, it is discrete samples. Another way to represent music, and this is actually what's interesting for us, is called the MIDI protocol. So this is what we can see on the right, and this is what we dealt with in our project. So MIDI files usually uh, used for professional audio purposes or a simple lightweight music uh, uh, generation. And not generation in the sense of generating music, but for example, in video games where you don't want the heavy MP3 files. Uh, that was in the past. So uh, what a MIDI file is, as opposed to audio, is simply a list of instructions. So this is a list of instructions uh, saying to some synthesizer, for example, play this note at this duration that loud. And also when to stop playing those notes. We can see here that a MIDI message that is sent by a MIDI controller, and a MIDI controller uh, here doesn't look like a keyboard, but it's usually something that looks like a piano keyboard, it sends a MIDI message to a computer or a synthesizer, and that computer is producing, according to those instructions, uh, an audible note. And now uh, some, uh, some music theory on, on the Ktsama's leg. Uh, we're all very familiar with this thing. We've all seen it before. It's called the music staff. The music staff is uh, segmented by bars. So we can see these lines over here, and they are segmenting a bar. And notes, which also we know how they look like, they all live within those bars. Now I'm going to make a drastic simplification. Uh, each bar basically contains four beats and each beat value is a quarter in quarter note. So that means that if we put four quarter notes in a bar, we filled the bar. We put four, uh, four times quarter is the whole. Uh, so this is one way to do it, but as you can see here, uh, this is one way to do it in the purple, what I just mentioned. But as you can see in the blue frame, for example, we put two quarter notes in the bar and one half note. And as you see in the green uh, frame, we put Eight, eight notes, and this way we fill out the bar. Now you know, you all know music theory. The problem is with uh, uh, such a representation of notes in MIDI files is that we have way too much information because pianists are not usually playing uh, notes every quarter note. They play in all the spatial time. Uh, and it, this creates a problem because uh, it leads to high complexity for a model, and it also makes everything very longer. So we have in the time domain uh, this kind of problem and in uh, the velocity domain, and when I say velocity, I simply mean volumes. So a pianist would play in various dynamics. He would play uh, low notes and high notes in terms of volume. And this might be redundant information for us because all we want to know actually if something was play or not play. So we're probably going to use some kind of banalization to represent that. For dealing with, the, with the, the fact that we have a lot of notes scattered all around the time domain, which I just mentioned, we use something called quantization. So it might sound familiar because we talked about quantization in data science, but this is actually quantization in music, uh, in the music uh, world. 
So you can see on the left a bunch of nodes, uh, which uh, length represents uh, the duration represented by their length. And you can see that these nodes are kind of floating around and not sitting on the grid. Uh, but once we apply quantization to them, you can see on the right that every one of those nodes, this long node, is exactly starting on the grid. These four, uh, five nodes on this uh, pitch ex exactly start uh, on on some grid. And this really helps us by stacking nodes on one top of each other to uh, kind of minimize the, uh, it's kind of like lowering the resolution of the musical content we're dealing with uh, from continuous to discrete. And it's a nice way to think about it is kind of clustering uh, uh, the notation in the sense of music, not in the sense of data science yet. And you can see actually on the left that the uh, sheet music I just saw you, showed you before, once you applied quantization to it, then uh, if you applied uh, uh, eight note quantization, it would look like that. And one quarter note quantization, it would look like this. And this is exactly the same song, only kind of like shrinked uh, to like those three bars are just being compacted, uh, which is helpful to our purpose. This is how... Um, basically a MIDI file messages look like. So as I mentioned before, a MIDI file is sending instructions to, uh, to a synthesizer or a computer which tells it, play something or stop playing something. And uh, these, the most uh, basic messages that a MIDI file uh, or actually the MIDI protocol is based on is a note on and a note off. And this is something that really helped us uh, to uh, go ahead and engineer the data that uh, we wanted to use as features. Here is a, a simply a way that we can take any note and represent it in a numerical uh, sense. So this uh, A0 on the piano, which is kind of low on the left, is going to be represented by the number 21. And uh, the uh, note D2 would be represented by uh, 38. And overall, we have 128 notes all across the piano that can be represented this way. So once we've done this kind of representation, uh, so we have, we've read the MIDI file, and uh, once we know which notes and numbers are played, uh, we need to go from the musical world to the data science world. So everything needs to be represented in uh, NumPy. Uh, but when we just got started a second ago, I told you that uh, notes are represented in quarter notes, they're represented in eight notes in the musical world. So we kind of had to know how to transfer them to NumPy. So how to tackle this? Um, so what we did was uh, creating a NumPy matrix where each bar, uh, if you remember, this is a whole bar, is represented by 1,920 ticks. So what is a tick? On the left, you can see uh, in the matrix that actually each tick is a column. So a single tick is a state of the entire piano in a fraction of a moment. So this is just what's being play, played in a fraction of a moment. So it's not necessarily a quarter note, but just maybe a little tiny bit of it. So a way to think about it is that we are representing the entire, like the whole musical content in a much higher, higher resolution. So a, sing, a single tick, which is a column, uh, wherever one appears for some notes, it means that this note is being played. And if you uh, look at it on the pitch, kind of uh, on, on axis equals one, then on a row, then uh, uh, there will be a series of ones appearing as long as a note is being played. For example, like here, and a series of zeros for um, any time that an, a note is not being played. Uh, and this actually gave us uh, a decent representation. Uh, it, it is very sparse because we're representing a lot of ticks. And for how we dealt with this uh, sparseness, as well as how we eventually made the model, I'm passing the torch to Sophie. Thank you. So um, our data set was a Maestro data set, which is uh, the data set of uh, the Magenta, Magenta group. So it's part of uh, Google. Um, and basically, we had uh, 200 hours of uh, MIDI songs that contain only piano, which is very important because on a MIDI file, each instrument uh, <clears throat> is placed in a different channel. So we had to read only one channel, which is the piano channel, and uh, process it. And uh, after our first model, uh, 
we uh, we re re realized that we need to uh, uh, to create the MIDI files with overlapping. So uh, at the end, we didn't have uh, one million nine hundred twenty thousand samples uh, at at first. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, at the end, this was our data set. Uh, so this is the first model uh, we tried. We were uh, counting on the article, which is uh, uh, placed at the bottom. And it was basically two LSTM layers, and, uh, and it didn't work so well. Uh, you can see from the graph that we, uh, we were over, overfitting uh, right at the beginning. And uh, basically, either our model predicted like 20 nodes at the same time, which is unphysically, uh, or it predicted silence. Now, it's important to say that we consider the, the problem as multi-label binary classification. What does it mean? Each um, prediction uh, predicts each node as a single node, and you can have more than one node when you're predicting, because if you think of, uh, uh, of songs, it's not just one uh, note by, by the time. It can have multiple notes at the same time. So that's why we thought of it as a multi-label binary classification. So this was eventually our problem because after we, were consult we consulted with Morris, uh, he suggested us to uh, narrow down the problem and simplify the problem. Um, so we decided to go with just one LSTM layer and uh, use dense layer at the beginning. And since uh, the, the core notes that are actually playing in, uh, in, in our music is uh, located in the range of uh, 22 to 94, uh, we decided to send our model only the core part that is playing without the silence at the, uh, the lower range and the upper range. What? Seriously? Uh, okay, so just before you will see our amazing result, this is the base, base result, which is 0 0.013, which is quite bad. Uh, so uh, according to that, our result is actually amazing because we get to 0 0.17. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, basically, yeah, I don't want to waste the time. <laughs> So challenges, uh, we had to first understand the structure of MIDI file. We had to understand how to represent the data. Uh, the ar architecture that we're, uh, we want to send our model and each epoch took us 15 minutes, which is quite hard to, uh, to master. Um, okay, whatever, demo. Prepare yourself. Pause, 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 it's hard with the two screens. Oh, no, don't be that excited. <laughs> 0 0.17, remember. So this is the first attempt. Can you hear it? No. That's good. No? That's No. Just try to guess when our model starts the prediction. And this is a several, several predictions, not just one. <laughs> Can you recognize our prediction? <laughs> so this is the second attempt after uh, some uh, threshold uh, and parameter tuning. Which is a little bit dissonance, but I think it's quite an impressive result. Okay, but um, what our I mean, <laughs> so the the second approach for us was to try to simple is to do a simple model, uh, even even more simple. So we we looked at the notes as words, and quotes as a sentence, and when we did that. We got this result. Oh, 
Be creative, right? There's, there's good parts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So you got the the got point the, of it, um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> just last sentence. I know we discussed it with Morris in the monitoring neural networks uh, lesson, and also Hannah Hannah mentioned it uh, uh, at the workshop. It's really, really, really important to uh, to have a research log because we end up having so many parameters and different net network architecture. And each epoch took us 15 minutes and it was quite hard to manage all this information and uh, in a reasonable time, because in order to see some result, it takes you so long that you have to cherry pick your changes. So just keep that in mind uh, on your next challenges. That's it.